I don't know anybody that lives in Pennsylvania. It's weird. Okay. Mm. We're all back. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Ooh. Uh, Ooh. Someone has. Uh, someone has. Uh, Julia, can you try? Uh, Julia, can you try? I'm not typing. What you want me to mute myself again? Myself, come back. Can you come back? Can you can you use headphones or turn the volume down? You can mute too, but that'll okay. Uh, hi everybody, <laughs> welcome to this week's learning space. My name is Nicole Galucci. Uh, we are uh, have a whole panel of speakers to talk to you about some really cool stuff with early childhood uh, astronomy. Um, uh, so as usual, you can join in the conversation, you can ask questions, leave comments using the Q&A app. Uh, so that is uh, wherever you're watching there should, I think it's here, it might be here, I don't remember where it is on the screen, but there's a little yellow button that says join the conversation, Q&A, and I'll take you to the Q&A app. Um, if you're seeing the Showcase app right now, you can toggle back and forth between Showcase and Q&A to ask us questions and participate. Uh, I haven't actually opened that yet, but I'm sure we, yay, we have uh, our friends Nancy and Guido already saying hi in the Q&A, so hello. hello. Um, there's usually also some chatter going on over in the uh, comment stream of the event page. I don't normally check that during the show, but um, there's some really cool conversation usually going on there as well. So check that out if you're watching. Uh, so uh, welcome, everybody. And hi, Georgia. Hi, hey, Nicole. Georgia through the wall. Uh, we have a whole panel of people here. Uh, I'd like to have them uh, each introduce themselves really briefly. Um, Alice, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I'm Alice Ennevoldson. I'm currently mostly uh, affiliated with myself, which is Alice's Astro Info. But I've done a whole bunch of work um, over the last five years or so with early childhood education at Pacific Science Center. And then I've also been working with Anna over at um, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific with some of their early childhood stuff. Cool. Uh, Anna? Hi. Um, I'm Anna Hurst from the Astronomical Society of the Pacific in San Francisco, and we're currently in the midst of a four-plus-year um, NSF-funded project called My Sky Tonight, in which we are developing a set of um, astronomy activities for three- to five-year-olds for use in um, science centers and children's museums around the country. Um, and right now we're in the activity development phase. Um, we're um, working with some researchers, and a couple of them are here with us today, um, um, as well as a, a team of museum educators. So um, we have um, a great team that we're working with, and we're certainly learning a lot. At the ASP, it's a new audience for us. Um, we've been doing astronomy education for a long time, but um, not with this age group. So it's great to have a team of experts who understand um, how to work with the little guys. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, Jennifer? Hi, I'm Jennifer Gibson. I'm fighting a cold, so that's why I sound like this. But I'm faculty. I'm an associate professor in child development at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, California. And my research looks at how young children learn about the world around them um, in the context of family conversations and interactions with family. And a lot of what I've been exploring is young children's curiosity and inquiry in things that adults think of as science. Mm -hmm. And so astronomy is a topic that I'm very um, uh, much involved in right now, working with the ASP on this, on this grant, the My Sky Tonight grant. But I've also done some work in children's understanding of robotics and um, biology. Julia? I think I'm unmuted now. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Hi, I'm Julia Plummer. I'm an associate professor at Penn State University in science education. Uh, and my uh, my background and training is in astronomy. I did my PhD in astronomy education. So the, the breadth of my research has been looking at how students learn uh, astronomy with a strong focus on 
learning that starts with our own earth-based observations and looking at how students understanding of astronomical concepts and the practices of science and astronomy develops over time. So my research looks, now it's looking at preschoolers, but I've looked across elementary, middle school, high school, to college age students, but all within this realm of uh, learning about astronomy. Very cool. Awesome. Uh, and I wanted to share a quick anecdote the other day. Um, so we work for a, uh, Georgia and I work for a STEM research education and outreach center uh, and just the other day, they had a gaggle of, of toddlers or preschoolers in our resource center. They were testing some inquiry, science inquiry activities. Uh, I don't think any of them were strictly astronomy based, but I was asked to go uh, photograph them for our STEM center, and I was incredibly excited to do that because they were so <laughs> um, Alice, um, uh, we'll get started. I asked you originally um, to talk about this topic because of your article in Sky and Telescope about toddlers at the telescope. Uh, and in fact, if, if you guys are looking at the Showcase app, I've got a link to uh, a follow-up from that article uh, on Sky and Telescope that has uh, a bunch of resources that, that you can look at. So why don't you tell me a little bit about just the topic in general from, from your article? Okay, yeah, so, um, so that article sprung out of the fact that I, I have my own toddler now. She's three and a half, so I guess she's, she's technically into the preschooler range now. But I ended up being kind of frustrated about a few things about like the number of books that were available for very young kids, like ages two and and um, and, and under about astronomy because I'm an astronomy geek, so that's what I wanted to share with my daughter. Um, and I couldn't find a lot. I could find like Goodnight Moon, find any of that those cool space books that start a little bit older, um, maybe age four or so is when those, those books really start to explode and then they have tons and tons of them. Um, and also I really wanted to share um, looking at the night sky with her, which is very easy without um, any magnification, but of course we, we pull out our telescopes, yes, in Seattle we do pull out our telescopes now and then, um, and I wanted her to be able to look through them. My experience over the last almost 20 years of hosting star parties and being the person at the telescope who's helping people look through the telescope is that kids under about the age of seven just don't get anything out of looking at the telescope. They can't figure out how to put their eye up to the eyepiece. They can't figure out what they're supposed to do. They like they bang their heads into things. They grab on to it because they're trying to steady themselves. It's just nothing. And then once they're finally sort of lined up, they pretend they see yeah. what you've asked them to see because they've spent, they've already ex exerted all this work and they can tell it's important to you and to their parents that they see something. So you say, do you see Jupiter? And they say, yeah, yeah, I do. And you say, what color is it? And they say, purple. And you're like, well, you're not looking at it. <laughs> um, just because it's very hard to physically look through a telescope. Um, and I also remember the first time I learned to use a microscope, um, it wasn't taught to me as a skill. The microscope was pushed in front of me in middle school and they said, focus on this slide. And they showed me how to use the focuser, but they didn't show me how to look into the microscope and what I was looking for. And so I wanted to see if there was a way that we could scaffold very young children into looking into the telescope. Um, because I, teaching skills is very, very doable. Like we, There's tons and tons of research. You can teach almost any age person to do almost any skill. Um, it depends a little bit on their motor coordination, yeah. but you know what? You can teach skills. That's a very doable thing. So I started thinking about what it is about a telescope, and I realized that the paper... Um, like the toilet paper tube binoculars are just perfect because you need to look through them just like you need to look through the telescope and as soon as you realize that you need to look through the telescope it becomes much easier to use um, and then the limitations have to do with being very well lined up um, so hand a kid a paper towel tube or a toilet paper tube, and the first thing almost all of them do with it is they put it up to their eye and they look through it. 
Like, that's just, it's just a natural thing to do with a two. Mm -hmm. So you give that to them, and then you say, okay, now look through this telescope. Okay. They just looked through something, so it's a very it, it's very natural to go. Oh, look, another tube. This one has glass in it, but it's still a tube. Um, and then the other thing that I recommend in my the other major thing that I recommend in my article is um, that you use really wide eyepieces with a very wide apparent field of view. Like you want as much glass at the top of the eyepiece as you can possibly get because that eliminates the need to have to be exactly lined up. And those of you who've looked, who've helped um, audiences look through telescopes before and have looked through telescopes yourself, like the more magnification you add on there, like the tinier the thing is and the more you have to be lined up and everything has to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And what I was going for was, let's just look through a telescope and enjoy it and have fun. So I put a big eyepiece in there, um, not, not much magnification, nice wide field of view, and we look at things like the moon and Jupiter that are very bright. And it's just so easy. Um, and I've, just, I've had tons of success with this. And um, I think that with a couple of these tools that age seven cutoff for using the physical tool of the telescope isn't there anymore. That's great. That's great. I um, yeah, I remember using the uh, the six inch um, refractor uh, old old eighteen hundreds telescope at UVA, and you know have it set perfectly, and little kids come up to it and they're like, boop, <laughs> they move it down to their eye, because um, yeah, that 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 isn't apparent. And I, I love the um, the toilet paper tube idea. Um, so, uh, what about this project by Skies Tonight? Uh, Jennifer, or, or any of you that want to chip in, what was the kind of the impetus for this project, the My Skies Tonight project? Anna, do you want to take that one, since it came to the ASP first? Uh, sure. So, um, we have been working with museums and nature center uh, museums, nature centers, parks for um, close to a decade now. We have a program called Astronomy from the Ground Up where we provide professional development and um, activities for informal, edu informal science educators who want to do more astronomy in their venues. Um, and we kept hearing from that audience that they were getting a lot of really young visitors and they weren't really sure what to do with them. <laughs> um, so we were seeing more and more of a need for really good quality materials to reach this age group in that informal setting. Um, and uh, so that we just decided we wanted to pursue that path. Um, and we also recognized that it was not an age group that we had much expertise with. We have, you know, a, a whole slew of, of excellent astronomy activities that we've developed over the years. Um, that's that's kind of our forte, but not for this age group. And so we saw that we needed to team up with um, Jen and Julia and um, also Maureen Callanan from um, UC Santa Cruz, um, who all have done research into how children learn about um, science and sometimes astronomy and space in particular. Um, as well as a team of um, educators who work with this age group regularly. So we're, we're locally in the Bay Area, we're working with the Lawrence Hall of Science, the Children's Discovery Museum in San Jose, and the San Luis Obispo Children's Museum. Um, and uh, us, we at the ASP are lucky we get to go and, and play at those museums and, and try out the activities that we're developing. Um, so that's how it all started, and um, we're about halfway through our, our four-year project, so we're still very much in, in the development and um, trying out new ideas. Cool. So, um, Jennifer um, and, and maybe Julia as well, what is so different about teaching science to these very young children as opposed to teaching science to elementary school or higher? Um, well, for me, it's more of engaging children in the process of scientific inquiry, so figuring out what they're curious about and um, supporting that curiosity. Mm -hmm. I'm less concerned with the specific pieces of content that they might take away than engaging their interest and helping them to identify 
um, themselves as kids who like science, kids who enjoy exploring and discovering, and not having worked with you know older kids very often, um, I think that that the pressure is off at the preschool age because you really just get to just dwell in their enthusiasm and help support that and ignite their interest versus what I perceive to be happening in school systems where there is a little bit more emphasis on content. I think Julia could probably speak to that. Yeah, I, I agree with, with everything that Jen said that, you know, there's there's a couple of differences that we're looking at here. One is, you know, we're working with preschoolers instead of older children. And so it's, it's a sort of a constant evaluation of what kind of experiences might they be bringing with them? How do we use those experiences? What are things that might be brand new in this that they will need support on? These are not words that they've heard, but it doesn't mean they can't learn them. So, you know, figuring out, and there's, you know, we're, we're, our, our project is aimed at three to five-year-olds. Well, three-year-olds aren't all the same, five-year-olds aren't all the same, and there's big differences between theirs. So our work is really constantly, you know, wrestling with all of that diversity in our audience. Um, and then there's, of course, the important aspect of formal visit versus informal. So our project is about creating experiences, uh, designing experiences that will work in informal settings, museums, science centers, nature centers, parks, you know, places where audiences can come and go as they, as they please. So we're not planning for a particular group that will stay with us over time. So that's a different way of thinking about audiences than formal classroom science planning where you're like, well, the first time I see them, I will just learn who they are. I will find out what they know, and I'll plan from there. We're planning for, you know, maybe this is it. This is the 30 minutes that those kids are going to engage with this. What can we do to get them maybe taking that next step after they leave the museum? Yeah. And I think that, oh, go ahead, Georgia. Um, oh, I was just going to ask, so are you looking at activities that currently exist and trying to modify them, or are you kind of going for something totally different and, and creating your own, you know, special activity from scratch with the program? Anna, do you want to take that since you're... Yeah, you know, we're, we're doing both. We're, we are definitely going... We're seeing what's out there and what's working. Um, a lot of, you know, we're taking some inspiration from the activities that we have for older kids and seeing if we can adapt them to work for this age group. Um, we definitely don't want to reinvent the wheel, um, but in some cases we are, we are starting from scratch. Um, there's... There's a lot of activities out there that people will um, will use for the younger age group without really considering um, what is developmentally appropriate. So we're um, really testing out the materials. Um, how do I want to say it? Um, we're we're testing them out and um, working again, going back and forth with our researchers and the educators to make sure that. Um, they're adapted to, to be really developmentally appropriate for that age group. Um, and so a little of both, adapting and, and starting from scratch. And we didn't just jump into activity development without doing our front end research. So we looked at kids in this age range from three to five years and we tried to identify the kinds of things that they're interested in mm -hmm. and the ways that they approach doing science. So some of that front-end research was looking at existing literatures and some of it was data that we actually collected. Um, just to give you an example, sometimes when I tell people about this project they say, preschool kids and astronomy, really? You know, is that really even a relevant yeah. science domain for them? So we thought we needed to get some evidence on that and um, what Maureen Callanan and I have done is a um, diary study in which we ask families to document for a period of two weeks all of the conversations that they're having with their children about nature. We just say nature. Mm -hmm. And um, we collected all of this information. We collected it with a variety of different populations of families. And we found that of the set of conversations they reported, across all of the different populations that we looked at, astronomy-related talk was about 20% of the conversations. So right there, we're like, yes, kids are interested. <laughs> They're talking about the sun, the moon, the stars, shadows. 
this is a relevant topic to be pursuing for this age group. And these were fairly unprompted questions? They were coming up with it on their own? Yeah, they were coming up with them on their own, and they were coming up with them in ways that were um, embedded in their everyday experience, mm -hmm. things that they were noticing out in the world or when reading books, a variety of different types of contexts. I will say, though, that 40% of their conversations were about animals, so that's definitely, you know, at the preschool age, they're very interested in animals. Oh, yeah, especially if they have one in the home. <laughs> yeah, right. Yep. Uh, we have a question that kind of relates to that family tie from Nancy Graziano. Um, how often do you engage the kids' parents in various activities, particularly when it comes to continuing uh, to engage their kids at home? So either So you talked a little bit about their... their Speaking with the parents, what about with the activities as well? I think that's a critical part of part of our activity development. We're constantly thinking about the multiple settings in which the activities we develop might be used. And one of those settings is going to be maybe drop in, stumble upon activities in the floor of an informal learning space. Mm. And in that context, we really want to engage the parents. And so we're trying to provide activities where there's entry points for parents to take a role in engaging with their children rather than sitting back and letting a facilitator just um, take over and run the activity. So Anna, you, you've been doing some of this. Do you have any particular examples of how that's been working? Let's see. Okay, sorry, I thought I was muted. Uh, sure. So. Um, Let's see, what's a good, exa good example of that? Um, one of our favorites is um, building a space explorer where we um, put out all kinds of recycled materials and just doodads and um, um, ask the um, families to design a, a, a vehicle of some sort that can explore another world. And we give them some of the features of that other world. Um, and this is one where we... Um, we're, we're actually working on the best way to encourage families to, um, uh, so we, we really like this one and we've got it pretty fine-tuned, but we're working on how to get families more involved um, mm -hmm. and um, work together to design a rover um, that has certain tools that will um, work for a certain planet. Um, so um, another one that we, that another activity that has been working out really well um, since the beginning is called Bear Shadow. Um, we start out reading a book, um, uh, Moon Bear Shadow by Frank Ash, which is about a bear that goes fishing and his shadow scares the fish away, so he spends the rest of the book trying to get rid of his shadow, um, burying it in a hole or nailing it to the ground or running away from it. Um, and over the course of the story, you notice, um, without, without the story calling it out, the sun is moving across the, the sky. Um, and his shadow is, is gradually moving as well. And then in the end, he gets to catch the fish, and his shadow catches the fish too. Um, and so then we have an, a tabletop activity where we're exploring the apparent motion of the sun. Um, that's the high level of what we're going for, but really for the kids, it's experimenting with shadows and how if you change the, the, the position of the object to the light source, that changes the shadow. Um, and this is one where we've gotten some great um, parent interaction as well. We have some cards with some challenges. Can you make a? Can you make the bear have a long shadow? Um, we give them a. I'm sorry. They, we give them a flashlight and a little bear figure and a little scene. Um, and we ask them, can you make a long shadow? Can you make the bear shadow touch the fish in the pond um, or hide in the, the shade of the tree? And we've gotten some really great. Um, parent interaction with that where they help their kids work through how to how to make those shadows. Yeah, that's an important aspect of a lot of family science projects and we've talked about that previously on this show is that when we say family science we don't just mean drop off your kids and have them do science mm -hmm. with us, right? It, it's get involved too, which is really important. Uh, we have a question that um, I, I missed from a few minutes ago but it, uh, we touched on this a bit but maybe we can expand a little bit more on this. This is from Sylvan Westby. Uh, what's more important early on, or what's the general angle of attack? Uh, and he offers uh, things like awe and wonder, uh, learning and memorizing facts, or learning to apply critical thinking. Maybe you can touch on um, how much those three aspects get worked in with early childhood. I'll, I'll go ahead and start on that. So the three were kind of that wonder, maybe that ties in with interest um, and, and uh, engagement, uh, identity. 
um, learning facts and uh, mm -hmm. more factual based knowledge and um, what was the, the third one was thinking applying critical thinking. thinking yeah so I'd say that for those perspectives like for us we we start with maybe identifying something conceptual that we're working towards but that I don't think really defines how we're judging success you know we're not our goal is not that they're going to learn a bunch of facts but that we want to figure out what might be an important astronomical phenomenon that they can explore and so then it becomes more on those other two pieces mm -hmm. having them become interested in it so that they'll want to continue more uh, and, and they're they're able to explore their own interest in it and then the, the to me the critical thinking piece ties in with um, one of the aspects that I'm most interested in is their engagement in science practices because this is now learning about the process of science and and which will allow them to further their own learning so in the example that uh, Anna gave bear shadow mm -hmm. is a great example because while they may learn some critical pieces of science along the way they're doing that through their own investigation they're experimenting they have a model of a flashlight as the sun and a bear and they are through their own observations testing well how can I change the shadow how can I do this which is I think far more critical for this age group for them to learn how to do science than you've got to do both you've got to learn some conceptual science along the way but the how to I think is more valuable how to look through a telescope is more valuable than knowing Oh, I can. There, you know. Now I see the rings of Saturn. You know, it, it's that process that they're engaging in. And I think that cycles back to the person who had the question about parent support and parent engagement, because I think that um, sometimes parents are hesitant in the domain of astronomy because they doubt their own content knowledge. But mm -hmm. parents can support their children's sense of awe and wonder, and parents are, can support their children's inquiry practices or the scientific mm -hmm. practices skills, too. So it's really an entry point for the whole family for both of those. Yeah, and something I wanted to say is I think at the preschool age, we're using, we, we, almost, we almost want to use all of those as angles of attack because preschool is when you're laying foundation and you're doing building blocks of all of those things. Um, I'm not a big memorization of facts person. I tend to be all, all inquiry and process and critical thinking and let's bring art into it kind of person. Mm -hmm. But there is um, this preschool age. They're doing the um, they're doing the sponge thing with their heads, and they they love to learn facts and hear new words mm -hmm. and learn to say those new words. So I think that at this age although that's not the emphasis that we need to have where they need to come out with a lot of that we we don't need to avoid it because it's it's mm -hmm. part of it's part of the things that we need to know they need to have some awe and wonder they need to have some facts and know some of the vocabulary of science and mm -hmm. they need to have those critical thinking skills so in preschool we're beginning on all of those and it's later on in school that we solidify that but right now we need to start on every level. This is something that um, the new, you know, sets of science standards in the U.S. are trying to emphasize, or these these science practices. Um, and so maybe we can tie a little bit into how are you preparing them for these these science practices in particular? Uh, I think Alice, you talked about having a pre-K sort of standards for um, to go along with that. Yeah. I did an exercise. I was I was talking with some of my my daughter's preschool teachers, and they were being told by the director of the school that they needed to put more science in their classrooms. And I said, "Oh, let me look at your lesson plan, and I'll I'll help you figure out a, a, a few ways that you can integrate more science into your classroom." And I looked at their lesson plans, and they were full of science. Mm -hmm. And I went, "Why Why do you need me?" And I realized that they were having problem a uh, difficulty recognizing that there was science in their lesson plans and recognizing what counted as science. Mm -hmm. And so in addressing the issue of what counts as science um, for preschoolers, I looked around at all of the standards that are available for, for early learning, the, the 
the standards about like zero to three guidelines and Washington state standards because that's where I am. And there isn't very much science in them at all. There's a little bit of we have seasons and a little bit of farm animals. Um, but pretty much other than that, it's talking about the standards are talking about social skills and motor skills and um, pre-reading and pre-writing a little bit and, and pre-math. Um, but not a lot of pre-science either. And so since they didn't have what I was looking for to point to out to preschool teachers as this counts as science and this counts as science and this counts as, as science, and if you're being told to do more science, do one of these six things. Um, I went to the NGSS because the, the, the Next Generation Science Standards because I've been studying those and they're new and they're awesome and they're really hard to read. And I took the lowest level of those and started pointing out how you could begin to address those topics at a preschool level. So not in such a way that I think that we should be applying NGSS to preschool because I don't that's I don't think that's appropriate and I'm not even sure that we need science standards for preschool but I think a guideline for teachers who don't know what counts as science would be helpful that the process of science is something that counts. And so I took the NGSS and I just, I sort of turned it into bullet points for the, the early learning, the, the like K2 stuff, turned it into bullet points and I said this is how this would look if you were starting to address it in a preschool classroom. And this is a, a topic that's related to this that you could do so that kids sort of have, have some exposure before they hit that in kindergarten. Not saying we need to go through all of them and things like that. So that's what that's what I did. I I made this document for preschool teachers. It's still pretty dense because the NGSS is really long. Um, yeah. And that I I'm not sure. I mean, it depends on the preschool teachers, but the the ones that I've been exposed to don't already know science. The document that I have is still a draft because I think it's too dense and too intense for someone who's maybe afraid of science or doesn't know what counts as science. Mm -hmm. But um, where else are you going to say, here's where you can start? Kind of the beginning of that uh, learning progression through the standards. Right, because yeah. the NGSS is organized around that concept that we should think of learning as just increasing steps of sophistication so that at preschool they're even at preschool, they're already pulling in some of their already. They already have ideas and observations. So, but they're still starting to pull together. Um, and the other thing that the NGSS focuses on is a fusion of content and practice, so that we shouldn't be teaching science, you know, like inquiry skills separate from content. That you learn those things together. So, I, I think it's yeah, it's an entirely appropriate way to say, right? What what do these really high level things talked about? in the NGSS. What does that look like as early learners start on the pathway? So we have an interesting question from Nancy um, again. It, it, it's uh, asking, it's kind of two parts. Uh, if, you, if you've seen in your research or, or with these activities, is there any significant distinction in level of interest, interest between boys and girls at this age? Uh, and the second part of that, what about um, parental support? Do you see parents pushing more on either girls or boys for this, for, for science? I don't think we have the research evidence yet to say definitively, so probably what we could share is anecdotes or impressions, but we are gathering that research, so we're videotaping family interactions at all of these activities mm -hmm. and analyzing them on a variety of different verbal and nonverbal measures. Um, you know, in, in the time that I spent at the San Luis Obispo Children's Museum observing and doing this, doing this data collection, we didn't see, and we, we did some quick what we call blitz coding, so really fast turnaround information, and we weren't seeing that the activities themselves attracted boys more than girls, girls more than boys, nor did they seem to hold boys longer or girls longer at this age. These kids were all equally enthusiastic. The parent question, I think, is something more subtle that we would actually have to be looking at those those videotapes to um, really explore. And there is precedent for um, 
for research on young children's engagement in science with uh, in a museum setting where parents have sometimes been shown to offer higher levels of science explanation to their boys than girls and this was in physical science domains mm -hmm. and it was something that we were able to alter at the San Jose Children's Discovery Museum by creating um, exhibits and activities that kind of explicitly invited families and girls to participate um, and by doing that the the difference in parent talk to boys and girls um, evaporated. Oh, that's fabulous. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. That's very exciting. Um, yeah. I don't, uh, we have some pick. Oh, go ahead. I was, I was going to say, one of my, I, I was very worried about that um, during, because during one of my lessons, I ended up, all the girls ran away, ended up leaving very quickly, and the boys stayed with me the whole time. So I was wondering if that was a, because of the activity or what. And then the, the next time I did activities, all the girls stayed with me and all the boys left. And something I've been noticing, in, again, this classroom, is that the kids are starting to move in groups now. Um, they've started to, instead of doing side-by-side -side play, they're starting to have um, groups of friends. And those tend to be gendered groups of friends. So there's a group of girls and a group of boys and a group of girls and a group of boys. But it's not girls against the boys, and it's not entirely that way. So I think that what I was seeing on, that, on those days was that a certain group was staying with me, not mm -hmm. that the boys were staying with me or the girls were staying with me. It was that the group was staying as a, so, as a social cohesive group, and then they would leave as a group. So... Again, that's anecdotal, and so I think Jen's got a lot more that she's got, especially of being able to make that change disappear. Um, that was that's really cool. But I, I would I would say I was very worried that first day that I was only talking to little boys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's really interesting, and and I'd like to know how so was just completely. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know if I cut anybody off. Um, I was going to ask more about the data that you guys do collect and how do you, you know, what do you use to sort of tell yourself that, yeah, this activity or this feature of this activity is successful and we're going to kind of develop that further or this is something that isn't working. Um, you mentioned, you know, some video and some observation. Um, what else do you guys do to sort of get that, that um, information for yourself? I think it's interesting because sometimes the data that comes from the videotaping um, leads to a conclusion about the success of an activity that ends up not really being appropriate to motivate further activity development. So let me just give you an example of an activity that we've abandoned called the Sky Window. Um, and in this activity, parents and children were invited to sit down and make basically a frame one side was blue, the other was black, and they could glue um, different sky-related items to either the day side or the night side. And the data from the videotaped observation suggested that this was really successful. They stayed a really long time. There was a lot of conversation about astronomy-related activities. But at the heart of it, our educators just thought that it was worksheety and not um, engaging the science practice skills that we're very, very committed to supporting in these contexts. So Anna can speak more to this because she's really the one having to find the balance between data and actually creating good activities for this um, purpose. Sure, yeah. Yeah, and actually, so um, there, there's a lot of um, information we're collecting. We, we have the data from our researchers and also just their expertise in knowing what other research is out there and making sure that we're keeping that in mind as we're going forward. Um, we tr try out the activities ourselves um, often at Lawrence Hall of Science um, uh, but also the other local museums we're working with and then we've um, we already created the first um, pilot version of this set of materials um, and we held an online workshop for around 20 um, museum educators around the country uh, earlier this year. Um, so 
the workshop will be a component of this project as well. Anyone who receives the materials will also receive training. Um, and that first pilot group has been testing the materials in their museums. Um, Alice was a part of that group as well. Um, and so we're getting feedback from them on the activities also about how does it really work in a museum setting. Um, we want to make sure first and foremost that these are engaging activities that the educators will use. Mm -hmm. um, and then and then make sure that these engaging activities incorporate those science practices and are developmentally appropriate. Um, because if even if it ha if if they include you know great science, if they're not if they're just going to sit on the shelf and collect dust, mm -hmm. then that was a waste of our time. Um, <laughs> so we're we're really trying to balance and go back and forth, check in with the researchers, check in with the museum educators, try it out ourselves, and just see what kind of um, feels right <laughs> when we try it out mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of back and forth and really good discussion and de healthy debate <laughs> among the members of our team. Um, I wanted to mention the sky window because um, I said that Alice was one of our um, a member of the pilot group and um, I was chatting with her when she happened to be visiting the Bay Area recently and she had tried that one out and she did, she made some adaptations to it and actually really loved it. So yeah. we may not have completely cut it. I want to go back. Maybe try out some of the. the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I might want to try out some of the things that she she changed to that. I don't know if Alice looks like she maybe she froze. Looks but, frozen. Um, oh. Oh. but I think if I could build on that, I think Anna hit on an important point. Part of Part of our understanding and our, you know, as we as we in, you know collect data in various ways on this, part of it is around how are these activities implemented in different spaces. So different choices that different facilitators make, or mm. you know, because it comes to how they're implemented, is going to make a big difference. So that's one of those really interesting tensions that we have. Is it the activity? Or is it some other peripheral things that make the difference? Um, and so, depending on what variable we're looking for at, you know, well, conceptually it's fine, but it's not engaging. But maybe it would be if we did this other thing. So, mm -hmm. and it's a cyclical process. So I think all of this reflects the idea that we come back around from development to research, back to development. And um, you know maybe Alice's adaptations are amazing because Alice is amazing, you know. And then we're going to try that with a bunch of other people who are facilitating and see whether or not you know there's kind of a similar enthusiasm on the part of the kids. Yeah. Yeah. I was unfortunately Alice dropped out. Um, yeah. as we're, we're talking about her behind her back. Yeah. <laughs> she showed that activity at Geek Girl Con. Um, oh. That's a very very kid friendly sci-fi fantasy convention. Uh, in Seattle, and so she brought that to our astronomy panel and and showed it off, and I thought it was really cool. I think a lot of the parents in the audience liked it as well. So not abandoned. Not abandoned. <laughs> I, I thought it was well it. it really it allowed like you know it's like one of my favorite things that I saw happen in one of the workshops that we did. Um, I'm working with Discovery Space uh, Pennsylvania here in State College, and earlier in the workshop, they you know the educator. Uh, showed the children pictures of the day and night sky. One of the pictures was of the daytime sky with the moon in it. And the and there's like these four little kids looking at this image and you know one of the boys he's like, that's the daytime sky. And this little girl, four year old girl, like, that's the nighttime, that's the moon. And you know, and so they 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 engaged in a very evidence based mm -hmm. discussion where different children were pulling in the different features of the image mm -hmm. to make their claims at day or night. Um, and in the process, I think they, they convinced the four-year-old girl that, well, the moon can be up during the daytime as well. Because later, when she made her moon frame for her, on her day and night sky frame, she put the moon on the daytime sky and said the moon can be in the day. So we could see how her thinking was progressing through this social engagement around you know, key astronomical phenomena. But let me just read you this from the diary study to remind you that we are working with four-year-olds. This is an example that, that we've been using um, about the day, about the moon in the daytime sky. So this is a four-year-old girl and she says, 
what is that circle in the sky? That's not the sun. And the mother says, it's the moon. And the child says, but it's not nighttime. <laughs> and the mother says, the moon rises early sometimes, sometimes before it's dark. And the child says, naughty moon, it needs more sleep. The sun's going to be mad at him. Right? <laughs> so preschoolers, they might be making these observations, and I think that's really important that they're noticing this, but the explanatory frameworks that they're applying might be really unexpected to an adult um, who's not prepared for how developmentally appropriate it is for the children to be anthropomorphizing things like the sun and the moon. Yeah, yeah, it's so fascinating. Yeah, they're kind of storifying the, <laughs> their observations and their experiences. And I'm sure that's probably what makes them so powerful as, as young mm -hmm. kids when you get those impressions and you, you are learning about your world and you don't even realize it, but you incorporate it in and then it just stays with you. And so mm -hmm. that sounds like a lot of fun. And it sounds like a really great challenge to take a activity like the sky window and then it shows some real promise in some ways but maybe it's not quite what you're hoping for in other ways and so then there's that fun challenge of trying to maybe you know save it and make it make it what it really could be <laughs> at some point. Fantastic. Yeah we've really learned the importance of um, leaving room for fantasy and play um, <laughs> and explanations like that yeah. Um, and it's something we always have to remind ourselves of <laughs> because we want scientific accuracy, um, but, but play is so important at that age. Um, and I was just, um, I know there's some photos and, and a short video, and I, I was thinking about this idea of how, you know, the, the um, Build a Space Explorer is an example of an activity that we knew was really engaging, um, but we want to make sure that it is also, you know, incorporating those science practices and so it could be just a craft activity and we know the kids will love just making a craft where they glue a bunch of stuff together um, and how do we relate that to astronomy and space science um, so we want to make this a sort of an engineering activity where they um, have a purpose in mind and they're choosing tools and thinking about what is a tool and tool use um, and building this spacecraft based on a certain purpose. Um, we know that not all the children are going to do that, um, but we're hoping to um, design the, the questions and the introduction such that um, uh, you know, a, a certain portion of the kids really do engage those sort of design practices. I mean, I have a, the, I don't know, you can see if the video works, there's a short clip of, of a boy from a um, summer camp at the Lawrence Hall of Science where he's talking about the, the space explorer that he designed. So as you guys know, I, I typically have problems with audio and uh, piping audio into the video, but I'm going to give it Let's see if it works. Uh, so yeah, you guys tell us uh, in the comments or in the Q&A if it's working. Uh, the people in the Hangout may not hear it, but the audience should be able to hear it. Mm, okay. Have have a object of what if you send the the things back to Earth. Oh, an ejector to send things back and to Earth. These are the wheels that can roll on, and these are the cameras, and this these are are the are the solar panels. Solar panels, good thinking. And this and. Um, this is what to hold this thing up. Ah. So that was that was Duncan, and he was explaining what all the di various tools were on his Explorer. Um, sometimes the kids glue a bunch of stuff together and then come up with what they are later. Um, and that's okay, that's valid too. We're, we're playing around with it a little more to see if we can get some of them to actually have a, have a purpose in mind ahead of time and choose their doodads to be tools um, to serve those purposes. Um, so that's one that you know we know is engaging. We're, we're going to keep that one, and we're just fine-tuning how to make it a really solid um, science and engineering activity for this age group. 
So I couldn't hear any of the audio. Um, what was what kind of things was he does he say in that video? Do you remember? Oh, what did he say? He 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 showed the solar plan panels. There was a was there a grabber? Someone to hold something up. Yeah, to pick up to pick up samples. Um, there was an ejector to send things back to Earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A little kind of little catapult type thing. Awesome. <laughs> um, so we were even thinking about, okay, I'm on another planet. I need to communicate back to Earth. Um, so it was very thoughtful. Um, and they had introduced it, giving some examples of actual um, spacecraft and rovers, and pointing out some of the tools that they used and you know what their purposes were. So they had some examples of of what kind of things they might include. Very cool, and and I'm getting comments from the audience that they did hear it. So yeah. oh great, we're not blowing up my computer this time. I was able to hear it. Yeah, I oh, heard you. You guys all heard it? Yeah. I only one. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. I, I will be writing up these instructions for people. <laughs> Last time I blew up my computer. Uh, do you want me to show a couple of the other pictures? Because there's some super super adorable. Sure, ones. sure. That'd be great. Let me get screen share started. Um, here. Okay, so that is um, Ellen at the Lawrence Hall of Science, Ellen Blinderman. She's amazing. It's been great working with her, and um, she's really skilled at working with this age group. So this was um, this is using ultraviolet sensitive beads, and um, uh, <laughs> talking about the sun's energy and um, sun safety. You know, wearing your sun hat and um, sunblock. And she actually starts out by telling a story with a couple of dolls about the dolls go to the beach and they have each have a little beach bag and they put on their hat and sunblock and and then they make the bracelets and go outside and notice how they change and the kids get really excited about that. Um, the next one is um, this looks like some astronauts. Yeah, this is a uh, moon sand <laughs> where um, <laughs> they are uh, pretending that that tub of sand is the surface of the moon and acting out what the astronauts might be doing and this gives a ch the kids get engaged just because they want to play in the sand um, but it gives a chance for some good one-on-one -on -one discussion about what it might be like on the moon and why astronauts need special equipment um, and then we also have a, a life-size version of visiting the moon oh my god um, this is adorable. Where we create a moonscape and put on special boots and gloves and air packs and they make their own space helmets um, and here's an example of where we're really getting into um, a lot of a imaginative play. Um, oh, they got sponges on their feet? Yeah, yeah, those were our special moon boots, although we're moving away from that particular model because there was a lot of tripping. Oh. <laughs> um, so we're trying out those sort of hospital booties that you just put over your shoes. <laughs> the special boots. That's, but that's our less bouncy. <laughs> next iteration, right. And putting in the foam <laughs> underneath that, that sheet. Um, so that was actually just a, a few shots of a couple of activities. I wish I had bare sh a shot of bare shadow to show you. I had a video, but it was it ended up being too big. <laughs> um, so just just a couple of shots of some of the activities that we're working on. Um, we're also working on a um, like a night tent where we have a, a a little dark space with glow in the dark stars and the sound of crickets and nighttime animals, and using that to talk about constellations. Um, we're working on um, a flower cratering activity. That's one of the newer ones we're working on. Where th there's an example of right a classic astronomy education activity, right. but how do we adapt that to be really appropriate for this age group? Yeah, um, I'm really uh, curious how it turns out because I brought that activity to Geek Girl Con in 2013, mm -hmm. and a lot of little kids are just like hands and flower. Yes. Yes. and that's just the like, challenge because they just want to dig into it. Um, yeah. So um, we're also working on how to simulate um, the surfaces of other planets and talk about, you know, rocky planets versus gas giants. So um, we're thinking about maybe using some shaving cream. So I'm excited for that one. That one will be yeah, messy. Yeah, that would just be fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, I think I just want to add to that, Anna, is um, the activity development process is also bottom up. So we're not only looking at kind of traditional things that might be done and adapting them for this younger age group. I think, in fact, that more of our conversation has been, you know, what are the kinds of activity settings in which this kind, this age child is engaged? 
and how can we build on those play routines to incorporate astronomy related content mm -hmm. so we have you know like the kinetic sand act or the moon sand activity is an example of that that comes from a routine that kids really enjoy and we're layering in some astronomy related content to that okay yeah, that's a great strategy. <laughs> so uh, one more question uh, from Nancy. Um, what venues are already offering these programs or what kinds of venues? Uh, maybe you can comment on, on, on your uh, dissemination plan for these activities and these lessons. Sure, these are designed for use in museums and science centers. Um, so right now, they, our first pilot set of activities went out to about 20 museums and science centers um, and that's really just to get their feedback. We will have the next pilot version, version 2, um, will be coming out early in 2015. Um, so we have, um, we're going to have another online workshop so if there's any museum educators out there who are really interested in, in trying out our next set of materials, there we go, there's the dates, mm -hmm. um, that'll be March 2nd to mm. April, what is it, 18th? So it says 10 on there. April 10th, okay. yes. <laughs> um, March 2nd to April 10th. Uh, we don't have the application up yet, but you're welcome to send me an email. Um, my address is there, ahurst at astrosociety.org, if you're interested in participating. And again, that's a pilot workshop, so we'll be asking if you if you sign up for it, you'll get a free set of materials, um, and we'll, in exchange, be asking for you to give your feedback on those materials and participate in some of the research that um, Julia and her colleague Michelle are doing about um, how the educators incorporate this into what they're doing and what and what they learn from the workshop. Um, and then the final version we will be releasing in the fall of 2015 and then we'll be distributing it to museums around the country. We'll have a series of of workshops so if you sign up for the workshop you also get the materials and they will be um, online workshops um, so you can participate remotely. Mm -hmm. Very cool, very cool. Um, do we have any any last comments particularly on the science and mixing of science and play, uh, the emphasis on play at this age, maybe for this age group? Anyone want to take that? Jen, you're muted. Oh, you're muted, Jennifer. <laughs> um, sorry. I, I would just say that that is at the forefront of our thinking because we know that play is learning in this preschool age period and that thoughtfully guiding children's play can really kind of shape the ways that they're engaging in those learning processes and the kinds of things that they're learning. So we're not trying to remove play from the equation. We're trying to build the opportunity to consider astronomy in play. Very cool. Yeah, when I was in the resource center, they were doing activity. I mean, if you just walked in not knowing what was going on, it looked like they were just kid, little, little, little tiny kids playing with things all over the place. Um, but they were engaging in, in inquiry into different, uh, they had like diffraction gratings and they had slinkies and they had dominoes and they, they were having a good time. They were clearly playing and having a good time, but, but figuring some things out as well. Yeah. And, and something I would say is, is especially if you're skeptical of, um, of whether or not play is actually learning science, is that there's a lot that you can do just by inserting good questions into the play. And this is one of those major shifts for me about the difference between playing in the sand and calling it the moon and playing in the sand as a model of the moon. Um, it's a very subtle difference in wording there, but the, the difference for me as the teacher or as the parent um, who's guiding that is the questions that I ask. The kid starts off playing the same way, whether they're just playing or whether we're, we're talking about it as a model, but then I ask or the teacher asks questions that, that sneak into their brain and turn it more into a model. Mm -hmm. And that's the cool part. Very cool. Very cool. Um, so I think we're about ready to, to wrap up. Uh, thank you all for, for sharing this project and sharing your experiences. Um, this is a topic we'd certainly like to revisit in the future. Uh, we've got some, some other groups that are, are doing great stuff in early childhood. Uh, and I know this is something that's actually come up in our journal club, Georgia. We talked mm -hmm. a bit about uh, science sure. across the board in early childhood education. So this is a, a hot topic. Um, some, some brief announcements for you guys. Uh, the uh, Actually, later today, there's a hangout. It's 4.30 my time, so it's 2.30 Pacific, 
uh, figure out the ET. <laughs> I can't do that in my head. Um, the the cast of the movie Interstellar. So Fraser's been sharing this hangout. I don't know um, if if anyone we know is involved in hosting it, but uh, the cast of Interstellar is going to be talking about the movie uh, on a hangout on air in a couple of hours. Uh, so that's really cool. Check that out if if you if you can. Um, Friday afternoon at what time? Noon Pacific. <laughs> I think it's 19 UT. Check check the uh, check Fraser's page. But the weekly space hangout will be wrapping up uh, on Friday afternoon. All of the weekly all of the news in space and astronomy from this week, which uh, will be a lot less uh, somber than than last week. Uh, last week things were hit pretty things were pretty rough uh, right before the broadcast. So so we talked a bit about that, or they did, talked a little bit about that. Um, and then Monday is astronomy cast with uh, Fraser and Pamela Gay. And then uh, back around on Wednesday, we'll be learning space again. So uh, feel free to email us, uh, educate at cosmoquest.org, if you have any questions from the shows or anything like that. Uh, uh, these, these, uh, this video will be posted uh, up on YouTube. It'll be up on the event page for all of eternity, whatever however long the internet is, <laughs> and the audio will be up on 365 Days of Astronomy. We'll put all the links in the show notes and all that fun stuff as well. Um, so so thank you guys so much. Uh, thank you uh, to Alice and Anna and Jennifer and Julia for, for talking to us about uh, My Skies Tonight and early oh, What a great astronomy. project. It sounds like so much fun. Really great. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, sounds like it was a really, really cool proposal to write, too. You guys have a lot of... <laughs> That's where my brain is right now. You have a lot of uh, aspects. We worked for a long time together. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great project. <laughs> That's excellent. Well, thank you guys so much, and uh, we'll see you next week on the Space. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.